Thank you so much, everybody. Man, it's good to be here this morning. It is so good to be here this morning. And uh, I just echo what Rob was saying. God has made it so clear over this whole process to me and my family that this is where we need to be. Uh, And, uh, you know, I know this to be true. When you are where God wants you to be, he's about to do some amazing things. And so I'm, I am expecting nothing less than some amazing things to happen in the coming months and years together. I know that we're going to see people come to Christ. I know that we're going to see families change forever. I know that we're going to see the city of Visalia uh, change because of what God is doing here at Visalia Naz. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to see how all of that shapes up. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a good time. I, I honestly get goosebumps just thinking about all that God is going to do. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just going to be a good time. And so, you know, but one of my goals as your pastor is to really just get to know each other, uh, to really get to know you, to get to know what makes you, what drives you, what makes you tick, all of those things. You know, maybe we can get together over a cup of coffee. I'm more of a tea guy myself, but I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Uh, I'm not against coffee drinkers. I'm just going to have a tea. So uh, don't be offended. But uh, I just want to get together, sit down, and just have conversations, encourage you in your your faith and if you're having doubts if you have questions let's have some hard conversations together because that's really what this is all about it's about growing together and so there's going to be times where we rejoice together over some exciting news there's going to be times where where we mourn together over some bad news there's going to be some times where we just spend time in prayer together but no matter what we do this together amen amen well before i get going into the word this morning let me just let me say a quick word of prayer for us god we love you And we are so happy just to be in your presence this morning. Happy to just be here in this place, to be able to worship together, to be able to dive into the word together this morning, God. And I just pray that you would speak through me this week, that the word would come alive through the words that you have spoken through me. God, would the words that come out of my mouth be your words and not my words? Would they be your words for your people on your day, God? No one here this morning wants to just hear from Pastor Chris. We all come to hear from you. So God, I just pray that you would speak through your word, move through your word. Would we leave this place knowing that we have met with the one true God, and would we leave changed because of that encounter? God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, one of the things you're going to get to know about me is that I love Scripture. I I love the Bible. I love to dive in and go deep. I love to be able to just open up the Word because there is so much there that challenges us. There is so much there that just causes us to think about things in new ways. It shapes us. It challenges us. And one of my favorite people in Scripture is Joshua. I love Joshua. Joshua is one of those people I, I just, you know, I could probably write a movie on Joshua and it'd be a bestseller. It'd be, it's, it's, the, it's the best movie story book in scripture, the book of Joshua. I love that. He's, he's one of my people. And in my Bible, as I read, uh, oftentimes I just come to these moments in scripture, and Joshua has a lot of them, where you just come to these moments and you have to just kind of sit back and just kind of soak it in and just be like, I just wish I could have been there. You know, and I, I designate those in my Bible. I have a star and I write replay room nominee. You know, I have, I have faith that there is going to be a replay room in heaven because there's a, so much in there that I just want to see. I just want to go in there and like rewind and be like, so wait, Moses, was, what was that burning bush look like? You know, I want to see the burning bush. I want to see some of these other things. Now, what did this look like? I, I think there's going to be a replay room. And Joshua just has so many of those moments. And the more you get to know Joshua and the more you see these moments, you really get to grasp what it was that, that drove him to do what he did and lead as he led. And so that's, I, wanna, I wanna just go back and just look at Joshua. I actually went back and watched last week's sermon a little bit, and Pastor Chris actually uh, brought us right to this point. He actually took us to the very first place that Joshua is in Scripture. Exodus chapter 17, uh, Moses, calls jo- uh, yeah, Moses calls Joshua to go and to lead the, the Israelites into battle, uh, against the Amalekites, and he does, and they win as long as Moses' hands are outstretched. Remember the story. That is the first time that we see Joshua in Scripture, is when he takes those people into that battle. You know, we, it's a pretty incredible image, as you see, there's another one of those replay rooms, right? You sit at Moses' his hands outstretched, and God just winning the battle for the Israelites. It's a pretty, pretty incredible image there. But you see Joshua through the latter parts of Exodus as well, on and off. Uh, but really where I want to pick up the story today is in the book of Numbers. So if you want to turn there with me in your apps or your Bibles, Numbers chapter 13 uh, is where we'll just kind of start this morning. Uh, you know, at this point in Scripture, in the book of Numbers, God has freed his people. 
He has brought them out of Egypt. He has freed his people. They are really, they've, they've walked on dry ground through the Red Sea. Uh, they have, uh, God has been with them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. He has fought for them. He has provided for them. He has freed them from Egypt. And at this point in Numbers chapter 13, they are standing right outside the promised land. And in Numbers 13, verse 2, God tells Moses to send some spies into the promised land. They send 12, and Joshua is one of these spies with his friend Caleb, who we'll know in a second. But they go, they spend some time there, they come back, and their report in Numbers chapter 13 is actually pretty incredible. Basically, it's this. This is exactly what God told us it would be. The land is, is amazing. The fruit is amazing. It flows with milk and honey, but, but the people there are too powerful. But their walls are too fortified. We can't go. That was the report from these 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb, out of the 10, were the only, out of the 12, were the only two that disagreed. And actually, in the book of Numbers 14, I apologize, you can just turn a page. Numbers chapter 14, verse 6, we see Joshua address the Israelites, and he says this Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephna, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Essentially, what Joshua was saying here was, God has promised this land to us. Don't rebel against God. He is with us, so let's go. And this is the, really the first glimpse that we get into the attitude of Joshua, into really what makes Joshua tick, what, what drives Joshua to be the kind of person that he is. And I really think this is a great spot for us to start our journey together as a church. And here's, as we move forward together as a church to go where God is calling us to go, I think we need this same attitude, which is essentially this. God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. So let's go. That was Joshua's attitude. God is who he says he is. He'll do what he says he will do. So let's go. Now we're gonna unpack what that looked like in Joshua's life and and his leadership, but I genuinely believe that as we move forward together, if we can hold on to those things and let that be what drives this church, God is going to do some amazing things through this. How do I know that? Well, let's just look at what Joshua was able to do. That day that Joshua stood up in front of everybody and said, hey, we, we, we should go, it didn't go his way. 10 against two doesn't win very often, does it? Two against 10, I guess, doesn't win very often. It didn't win that day either. The people of God were not going to go into the promised land. And to not go into the promised land was actually, a, a, it was an act of disobedience to God because God had told them to go. And so from not going, there was actually some consequences there. No one over the age of 20, when that decision was made, was allowed to go into the promised land, including Moses. Moses never went into the promised land. There were two that were allowed out of that group, Caleb and Joshua. And in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses is 120 years old at this point. He turns over the reins of the leadership of Israel to Joshua. He would be the one to lead the people into the promised land. And even in his parting words of Joshua, you can kind of see Moses encouraging this same attitude of God is who he says he is. He will do what he says he is, so go. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 31 uh, is really this this handover. In verse 7, it says this, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, In the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous. For you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, and do not be discouraged. Just a few pages over in Scripture, if you're following along in Joshua chapter 1, we see this echoed again and again. We see in verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. 
All right, we keep reading later on in verse nine. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Uh, it's repeated at the end of the chapter in verse 18. The people of God actually should tell Moses, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Let's go. Don't be afraid, be strong, be courageous, be bold. Why? Because God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. So let's go. So what did it look like? I could literally sit here and talk about Joshua all day long. I don't know if you get that yet. I, I love Joshua, but uh, I, uh, I, I, there's just a couple of examples, I think, of what having this driving force behind him really allowed him to do that I think we can, as we take this to heart, as we kind of understand and kind of try to apply this to our lives today, I think it will, will really help us as we move forward together. Because really the first thing that allowed, to, well, one of the things that allowed Joshua to do, we're going to skip ahead in the book here, but one of the things that allowed Joshua to do was it allowed Joshua to trust God, God's plan even when it didn't make any sense. Even when it didn't make sense, Joshua was able to trust in God's plan. You get to Joshua chapter 6. We know this as the, uh, the walls of Jericho, uh, this story of the walls of Jericho. And, uh, you know, the reason, this is another one of those replay room nominees in my mind. You know, and the reason it's a replay room nominee for me is because there is no world in which this plan should work. All right, this, this plan that God gives Joshua just doesn't make any sense at all. In fact, there's some archaeological estimates that put the wall of Jericho at about 13 feet high and six feet wide. It's wide enough for someone to walk on top of. And here's the plan that, that God gives Joshua in chapter six, starting at verse two. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sa them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. I just, I love this because I love to imagine Joshua's conversation with his generals. All right, Joshua, give us the plan. All right, here's what we're gonna do. This is what God told me to do. We're gonna walk around the city six days in a row, one time. And then on the seventh day, we'll walk around seven times and just be real quiet until the very end. And when I tell you to yell, yell. That's it. That's the plan. I can just imagine, like, the gen like it just put it in today's, like, just talking to generals and then being like, okay, and then what? You know? What next? Yeah, we're gonna yell really loud, but then, but now what? And Joshua's just sitting there like, no, this, this is the plan. When I yell shout, you shout. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. But you know what? Joshua had the whole army believing that God is who he says he is, and he'll do the things that he says he does. So you know what happens? They walk around the city, and on the seventh day, they walk around six times, and on the seventh time, they yell really loud, and the wall comes down, and they take Jericho. And this is, this is crazy. How in the world does this plan work? This plan works because God is who he says he is, and he'll do what he says he will do. The plan made no earthly sense. I think we need more of these times in our lives where we just need to just trust the plan of God and just understand that, that God is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he'll do. It doesn't matter what I bring to the table because it might just be he's asking me to yell really loud on the seventh time around and he's gonna do everything else. All right, we need to just be able to trust, but this belief allowed Joshua to trust God when it immediately didn't immediately make sense. But it also allowed not only just trust for the impossible, but it allowed him to just pray super boldly. It sparked his prayer life in huge ways. Just four chapters later in chapter 10, this is probably my, my favorite chapter, maybe in, all, I can't say that, in a, in a lot of scripture, maybe in the Old Testament. I'll say this is my favorite Old Testament passage here in Joshua chapter 10. This could literally be a movie script. Because here's what happens. Between chapter six and chapter 10, Jericho is conquered. They basically take over the region surrounding that, the region of Ai. 
The whole country is in fear of Israel at this point. And in chapter 9, the Gibeonites actually trick the Israelites into a treaty. They thought they were from far away, but in fact, they were actually really close to them. And so, but they, they, they made this treaty so the Israelites can't actually take over them. This quickly turns into a liability for the Israelites because the five surrounding kings hear about this treaty and they start to go against the Gibeonites who now have a treaty with Israel. The Israelites hear about it, Joshua hears about it. They pull an all-nighter to get to this battle. And then we pick up the story in Joshua chapter 10, starting at verse nine, and here's what it says. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. What just happened? I, you, you read this, and now you see why I have this circled in my Bible, the replay room nominee. This is, this is right up there at the top. I just want to see this happen. Anyone else on board for a replay room? Just me? No? Everybody? All right. Joshua has the audacity to pray that God would literally freeze time on his behalf. That the sun would stand still. That the moon would stand still. And scripture tells us God came through. How do you, how do you pray a prayer like that? And it's at this point, honestly, the skeptic in me just kind of rises up a little bit and is like, all right, did God really stop the earth on its axis? Did this really happen? Did, 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 did God actually stop the earth? What really went down here? I'm not the only one wondering that. Probably not even the only one in this room. All you need to do is just go online and Google the missing day. And what you see is people who feel like they found it and other people who feel like it's a hoax that people found it. It's the internet, right? You see both sides all the time. But I, I just, if you're like me, you sort of get bogged down in that detail. But I wanna just, I wanna just stop, even, even if it didn't happen. And just look at this prayer that, that Joshua prayed. How would he have the audacity to pray that the sun would stand still? Do you imagine, can you imagine the faith that it took to pray that prayer? Would the sun stand still? But I think I know I know how he did it. Because what drove him was that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. Joshua knew that the one who created the sun and the moon could probably do something about it. And so he goes to God and he says, you know, son, stand still. Just this, this bold prayer of Joshua Joshua, there's, there's more to the story of Joshua here, but I just wanna, wanna just go back and just recap real quick. This belief that, that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do just drives Joshua to believe God even if the plan is, makes no sense and it allows him to be able to pray prayers that are just bold and audacious prayers. I, that's... Really, I think if we can hold this same attitude, if we, can, if we can allow what drove Joshua to drive us as a church here at Visalia Nez, God is going to do some amazing things, amen? If we truly know, and if we live like we believe that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will can do, then just like Joshua, we can do these things. But here's something that we really haven't quite talked about yet. All right, part of Part of how Joshua was able to hold so firm to this belief is that he had come face to face with this before. Right? We, we talked about, you talked about last week, and I had mentioned this morning, Exodus chapter 17, where Joshua was leading the people of God in the battle, and they're, God is the one fighting. Right? They're not winning unless Moses' hands are up. That's not on Joshua. 
right? Joshua, he, but he sees this. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 13, Joshua actually goes up the mountain with Moses to get the two tablets. Right, he has been there in these, in these circumstances. We didn't even talk about Joshua 3. In Joshua 3, God parts the Jordan River while it's at flood stage, and that's not even the first time Joshua had seen the river part. Right, God, Joshua had seen God move, and he had seen God's faithfulness firsthand. And I think there are many in this room who could sit and just talk about the faithfulness of God how God has been faithful to you, and I know that there are people in this room who could tell me story after story of how God has been faithful to this church. I do believe that, and I know that. God has been faithful to Visalia Naz. People's lives have been changed because of this church. People have come to know God because of this church, and, and I'm looking forward to telling and hearing some of those stories, but it all, that, that knowing that stuff, knowing these stories of God's faithfulness can help us to really live like God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. I think this is just a powerful belief that we can hold. And if it's true, and we begin to live like we believe it, and, and, and move like a church like we believe it, then I think we will be able to trust God, even if the plan doesn't immediately make sense. God might call us to do some things as a church that seem uncomfortable, there might be some things that God calls us as individuals that, that don't necessarily feel good and don't make sense, but God has a plan for this church. And if God has a plan, I don't know about you, but I wanna be the church that's willing to say yes and go. I wanna follow that plan, even if it feels like sometimes we're just walking around a city once a day for six days. Because you know what? On the seventh day, we get to scream really loud and, and just feel the blessing of God. God will come through on his end. God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. And because of that, we can trust in his faithfulness. We can trust him even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's difficult, because he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. Not only can we trust him when the plan doesn't make sense, but we can begin to pray some really big, bold prayers. Because God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. When is the last time that you prayed a prayer like Joshua? A bold prayer. One that you knew you couldn't do on your own. There's no way Joshua prayed that prayer and thought, here's all the steps that I could also take to stop the sun and the moon. Nope. He prayed that prayer knowing the only one who could come through on that was God. All right, when was the last time we said a prayer like that, one that stretched our faith, asked for more than a blessing over a meal or a green light on the way to work? Like, when was the last time we prayed a sun stand still kind of prayer? I want to be the church that prays some big, bold, sun stand still kind of prayers because I know that as we do that, God will bless those prayers and he will make things happen at this church that cannot be explained outside of the power and the goodness of God. That's what we want. Now, earlier I said that Joshua was able to do those things, trusting that God is who he says he is and trusting in the plan and being able to pray these prayers because he'd seen it, he'd heard stories about how God had come through. The same is really true for us. But we can go further back than just God's faithfulness at Visalia Nez because over 2,000 years ago, God, Jesus proved that God is who he says he is and he did what he said he would do. From the early days of church, there's been a way of remembering and celebrating this fact that God is who he says he is, and he did what he said he would do. We call it communion. And in communion, we come and we celebrate the fact that God is who he says he is, and he did do what he said he would do. And then this morning, I just... I want to take communion together, and as we spend some time just reflecting on this fact that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do, and he did what he said he would do, I want to just spend some, spend some time just in reflection. You know, this morning as you walked in, you should have received some communion elements. If you did not receive communion elements, if you would just raise your hand, and we will, uh, we will get you some. I see some back here in the back. And as you, as you receive these, I just want you just to, 
just spend a few minutes just in reflection and prayer, just thinking, reflect over the sacrifice of Jesus for you. Know that God is who he says he is. Know that he did what he said he would do and he will continue to do what he says he will do. And just spend some time in reflection on how you can move out of this place today with that in mind. Just take a couple minutes in silence. First Corinthians eleven twenty three says this The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you receive the bread this morning and be thankful? Scripture continues, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we are grateful for the sacrifice that you have made for us. God, we are just thankful that you are who you say you are and that you did what you said you would do. Your son Jesus came. He died on a cross for us. He rose again on the third day for us that we might live with you for eternity. And God, I pray that as we move forward from this place, that, that knowledge that you are who you say you are and you will do what you say you will do would drive us, God. Would it push us forward to live in faith, to make a difference wherever we find ourselves, God? Will we just be spurred on and encouraged and empowered with the knowledge that you are who you say you are and you will do what you say you will do. And God, may that drive our church as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, this morning is a day to celebrate, and, uh, and with that same attitude of Joshua, that God is who he says he is, he will do what he says he does, and let's go. All right, that's, that's the mind frame. God is who he says he is, he will do what he says he is, he says he will do, so let's go. You know, we're going to sing a song this morning. I just want you to, to stand with me as we worship, and uh, it's a good day.
Amen. Amen. Now, as you uh, just remain standing, would you just hold your hands out and just receive a blessing as we go this morning? May our God, the God who was and is and is to come, the God who is who he says he is and does what he says he will do, the God who sends us out, may he bless you as you go this morning. Maybe in your workplaces, in your homes, and wherever you may find yourself this week, that you might make a difference for him, wherever that may be. Go encouraged and emboldened in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go in peace.